Midnight Facts for Insomniacs. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. People will always find a way to injure themselves. If you are a manufacturer of, like, insulating foam that is intended to protect your head from banging into things, people are going to find a way to fucking eat it. Or stick it up their sinuses in some fashion or that is pressurized. other orifices. Yar. Duncan, have you seen a movie called The Contestant on Hulu? I have not, but it sounds really familiar. It is a documentary about a late 1990s Japanese reality TV show that was basically a psychological torture experiment. And they did this on purpose? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, like reality TV can be. I think a lot of it is let's see how far we can push someone for people's entertainment, which really hasn't changed all that much. But this one goes super far. And it's crazy because it was like back in the day before we'd even had Survivor. Right. This was like, let's push a man to the breaking point for the lols. Ah, uh, Japan, leading technology once again. It was a really brilliant documentary, but I bring it up because I feel there is some overlap with this week's episode. Oh, God. I am constantly amazed, and I think a lot of us are, at the lengths that people will go to for internet fame or fame in general, mm. or just, I don't know, the bizarre things that many of us will do against our better judgment just because people are watching and we want to be cool or whatever. Fair. But I mean, maybe when I was 16, though, these days everyone can go fuck themselves. This is the weirdest shit I do. And I think that's valid because a lot of what we're going to talk about today really only applies to younger, impressionable people. Mm. We've kind of aged out of being stupid online. We're just like stupid in our day to day lives now. Yeah. And just only really stupid directively, like just towards mm -hmm. each other or just towards the insomniacs. So today we are talking about the most extreme and dangerous viral trends and online challenges. Oh, God, I know a few of these. What are the ones that come to mind for you? Um, I mean, there was the uh, clothesline challenge or whatever. There was the, the Tide Pod challenge. Okay. There was the Benadryl challenge. There mm. was like a couple of these things like that legitimately killed people or broke their necks. We're definitely going to talk about one of those. What was the uh, clothesline challenge? It probably wasn't called that, but it was essentially like tricking your friend to like run at you and then you clotheslined them. And a lot of people like flipped over and slammed on their necks. Some of these are just so ridiculous and basic. And they're like, how is that a challenge? It's like the punch your friend in the nose challenge. Yeah. I mean, this is why we need to get the newest round of jackass people just so that we can mm. have our sacrificial lambs. Like, like, yes, you go fuck yourselves up on the yearly and show us and then we won't hurt each other. And it's also not a challenge to do most of this stuff. The challenge is like not getting killed by your friend after you do the thing. Yeah, not getting killed by your friend, not getting arrested, not killing mm -hmm. your friend, you yeah. know, things like that. Exactly. So these types of mimetic viral trends, they are not just a phenomenon of the Internet age. We both grew up with these types of things and neither of us grew up with the Internet. Mm. As we covered in our memes episode, everything is mimetic. Things move through culture and society, regardless of whether it's online or off. And dangerous stunts, a la jackass, were not born with the introduction of the World Wide Web. No, sadly not. Am I the only person who still calls it the World Wide Web? You never hear that anymore. Yes, Grandpapa. <laughs> fire up your modem and hop on AOL for this next love, episode. I love it when you say fire up. <laughs> you bent over the hot internet. <laughs> Shit, too much choke. So anyway, viral trends have been around forever. Uh, back in my day, even back in the era of dial-up and slowly loading boob pics, we had a word for dangerous viral trends. We called them dares. Mm. And we took part in them, not because of online peer pressure or the promise of fame, but because we were bored. And sometimes it also helped solidify the pecking order in your friend group. Uh, for me, it was just, you know, life before the internet was terrible. There was, it was either go outside and like actually enjoy the fresh air, which fucking nightmare, mm. or, you know, just stay inside and do terrible things with your friends. Mine went either way. You could do terrible things to your friends outside. You could do terrible things to your friends inside. It's just that if you were inside, occasionally they had an NES and you could do that. That's true. You can be terrible anywhere, as we proved many times in oh, our youth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But these kinds of stupid, ill-advised dares have a long and storied history. I think about the movie The Christmas Story, with kids daring each other to put their tongue on the frozen lamppost. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there was the most famous dare that kids of my generation could not resist, saying Bloody Mary three times in the mirror. I thought it was five. Eh, whatever. Yeah. Mega. yeah, I did it. Significantly less dangerous than the lamppost thing, because you were not in danger of losing any body parts. Just like your dignity yeah. when your friend would inevitably like boo and you would let out a high-pitched shriek 
and lose all your manhood points that you didn't even have because you were, you know, 12. And <laughs> saying Bloody Mary into a mirror. No. Like a man. Not that that's what happened to me during the thing. I just, I've heard stories. Sure, sure. That wasn't a highly specific example or anything. So the truth is that some of these dangerous viral TikTok trends that you're probably familiar with started offline. For instance, the cinnamon challenge. Do you remember that one? Yes. Fill your mouth with a full load of dry cinnamon and try and swallow or some shit. Basically, yeah. Well, that predates the internet. It was actually inspired by yet another saliva-oriented trend that has cropped up here and there, the saltine challenge. Mm. The goal of this challenge was to consume six saltine crackers in 60 seconds without drinking any water. Mm Mm-hmm. I think part of the appeal of these challenges is that they sound so achievable. If you had told me in high school that I could not eat six saltine crackers in 60 seconds, I would have been genuinely offended. I probably would have put some money on it. Yep. And I most likely would have lost. Yeah, I wasn't a big drooler back then, so I just I would have <laughs> probably started at a deficit. And by the way, for our UK and Australian listeners, you might not be familiar with the dry, brittle, salty flour crackers called saltines. The UK version are Jacob's Cream Crackers, Mm -hmm. which frankly sounds a lot easier to swallow. A little bit more homoerotic, though. They sound much more lubricated. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, (laughs) much easier to swallow, actually, now that you mention that. The Australian version is the Wheat Bix Challenge. I'm guessing the challenge started as a way to scam people out of money because, again, I would put a lot of money on that and Mm. I would have definitely lost. Yeah. I'm not excessively slobbery, to my knowledge. (laughs) <laughs> I have receipts. <laughs> it turns out that it is a lot harder than it seems to eat six saltine crackers because the challenge exploits a very specific limitation of biology, human saliva production. Mm. Your mouth produces just enough saliva to aid in the breaking down and digesting of food, and sometimes there's enough left over to spit at pedestrians. Mm. Is that just me or... But typically, your saliva glands don't produce the type of water park volumes of tongue juice that would be capable of flushing down a mouthful of cracker that has turned into desert sand. Yeah, or just that nasty mush you could probably fake out for a uh, you know, paper mache. Yeah, powders like cinnamon and wheat flour are intensely absorbent, and in large quantities, they have the ability to essentially bum rush and overwhelm your salivary glands. What you end up with is an epic case of dry mouth, or cotton mouth, when the wheat flour or spice powder turns into a thick paste that encases every part of your mouth from your teeth to that dangling punching bag in the back of your throat. Your uvula, I believe it's called. It sounds like a brand of a uh, European car. Maybe, or, or perhaps a very interesting uh, sexual protection device. Mm. First you insert the uvula. Interestingly, medical professionals will often use a variant of the saltine challenge to diagnose Sjogren's syndrome, That is an autoimmune disease that affects the body's moisture-producing glands. So it is a disorder in which the body is unable to produce specific moistures. Ah, I thought it was, you know, trying to prove whether or not there was actually saliva in your mouth if there was a cat nearby. Not all moistures, by the way. I I think people with this disorder can still produce some moistures. Mm. Yeah. Nope, not walking into that one. (laughs) Just strolling on by. It bothers me that uh, we produce moistures on a regular basis. I don't like it. Dude, I'm producing moistures now. We are sitting in a balmy, warm-ass fucking studio right now. I'm Dude, sweating my balls off. People are always, like, worried about becoming too bionic and, like, giving up their humanity and everything. And I just, humanity is gross. We're just moisturizing everywhere. We're just seeping fluids, just walking through life, leaking. <laughs> Did you have to say seeping? <laughs> seeping makes it sound like there's an open wound I should worry about. Moist is already bad. Most people uh, hate the word moist. Moist doesn't but, bother me, especially in cake. Well, I'm glad it doesn't bother you because you're one moist motherfucker. That's very true. I would go so far as to say damp. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Another reason the saltine challenge in particular is so alluring is because under certain circumstances, it is very achievable. Mm. For instance, Peyton Manning famously conquered the challenge on his second try by stacking the crackers, mm-hmm. which I guess is a, it's one of the strategies that the internet recommends, along with uh, don't swallow your spit. So let some saliva build up in your mouth before starting. That seems pretty obvious. No, you wouldn't have to tell me that. Yeah. I'm not going to like suck on a towel for five minutes before before trying to overcome the dryness of my mouth. You know what that is? That's the saltine challenge on hardcore. Yeah, that's ultimate mode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How you unlock the cinematic at the end of the challenge. <laughs> there is an even older variant of the saltine challenge that dates back more than a century. In this version, the idea was to eat a specific number of crackers and then whistle a tune. 
a children's television show in the 1970s called Zoom featured that version of the challenge. Mm. And it turns out there are people who are uniquely suited to dominating this event. They are the opposite of the people who have Sjogren's syndrome. Some people produce more saliva than others and thus can choke down more crackers. Yeah, Drulies. <laughs> Jesus. Probably, I'm a bad person. It's probably a disability. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. It's really not something we should be mocking. But I did. <laughs> now, when it comes to the cinnamon challenge, in which you have to eat an entire tablespoon of cinnamon, the best strategy is to give up, because that challenge is dangerous. Yes, and impossible. Yeah, at some point you are basically inhaling melange directly into your lungs, which can be toxic. The cinnamon challenge might seem easy because it involves only a tablespoon of powder, but again, the incredible absorbency of the substance will just defeat your overmatched salivary glands. It turns out salivary glands almost as pathetic as rubber trees and the force of gravity. <laughs> and we're back to this. <laughs> just adding more victims to my, to my list. Things you can point and laugh at, never worry about. And cinnamon is a spice, so it is not typically consumed in these quantities. Right. The attempt to do so can involve some additional unpleasantness. The chemical compound that gives cinnamon its cinnamony flavor, cinnamaldehyde, is a very powerful essential oil, and in these quantities it functions as an irritant to the skin and mucous membranes. Yep. Some participants in the challenge have described the experience as being a lot like trying to consume powdered pepper spray. Yes. As myself, Tony, and uh, Jordan can attest after an afternoon of trying to get high and not having anything to get high with, we smoked some cinnamon, and it was dumb. What the fuck? Yep. Was this pre-internet, or yes. did the internet fool well, you into thinking? The, the internet informed us that nutmeg was a thing, but we didn't have any. So we were like, <laughs> cinnamon's kind of like nutmeg. You put them both in. Now, granted, both of them were on acid. I was drunk. <sighs> so they were just like, let's do this. And I was like, okay. You smoked cinnamon. I did. It hurt. Smoked cinnamon sounds like a delicious spice that would be actually used on things, but probably not to, not flavor, your lungs. Not to flavor your lungs. Yeah. A tablespoon of any spice is going to be terrible. Yeah. So even imagine just consuming a tablespoon of salt or pepper. That sounds horrific. Pick one. A tablespoon of ginger, a tablespoon of whatever yeah. the fuck. It's going to taste horrific. These are condensed chemicals, basically. Yeah. It's going to activate your senses in potentially all the wrong ways. Yep. All of which leads us to the first question that we have to address, which is why would anyone agree to do these things? Yeah. Well, a caveat here is that not all that many people do. The actual prevalence of these so-called trends is vastly overblown. Media outlets are always looking for a new story about some horrific viral trend that is sweeping the nation and endangering children because alarmist parents will watch pretty much anything that you tell them has to do with the safety of their kids. Right. And I get it. If I constantly had to worry about Inky engaging in stupid self-destructive behavior... That would stress me out. Mm. I only have to worry about him engaging in stupid furniture destructive behavior. And boy, does he. Or flesh destructive behavior, if he's not too careful with those, those claws. Yes, with his little ginsus, yes. Anyway, even though much of the hype around these challenges is overblown, when people do participate, one of the main reasons is youth. Having a young brain is innately dangerous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My best advice, try not to be young if you can avoid it. Try to live through youth, mostly. If you are currently young, just stop it. <laughs> stop it! <laughs> According to a Florida University article, quote, the human brain isn't fully developed until a person reaches their mid-20s, and the parts of the brain that relate to reward and doing what feels good develop more quickly than areas linked to decision-making. As a result, teens are more likely to act impulsively and risk physical injury to gain popularity, unquote. Can confirm. I don't think we needed Florida University to tell us that, but uh, there you go. But we do enjoy having scientific proof that we're <laughs> morons. Now, another reason people might end up engaging in stupid online challenges is because they have escalated from others that were less dangerous. Many of these viral trends are essentially harmless, so people can be lured into a sense of security, believing that the internet could not possibly lead them astray. I don't know. That whole ice box challenge or whatever the fuck it was that was going through everybody and all the people were doing it who were celebrities. I was like, this can only get worse. I mean, that's a good example of one that didn't actually hurt anyone mm. and then could lead to other ice related challenges. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Oh, OK. And then, of course, there was the relatively harmless trend in which I participated quite vigorously, along with my friend Julian, planking. 
Hmm. This is where you would lay your rigid body on some unexpected surface, typically in public. Hmm. But notice I said that planking was relatively harmless. Of course, the news focused on the one idiot who managed to kill himself via planking. Oh, God. Quote, Sunday Acton Beale. That, wow, that's a name. Are we allowed to be glad he's gone? Sunday Acton Beale, a 20-year-old from Australia, fell to his death from a Brisbane apartment balcony where he was attempting to plank on a railing. What the... <laughs> I'm kind of sad that we live in a world that doesn't include a man named Sunday Acton Beale. I didn't even know that. I didn't appreciate what we had until he was gone. Dude, it sounds like a statement. Ah, Sunday Acton on Beale again. Beale's death prompted Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard to call, quote, an end to the internet phenomenon. She said, there's a difference between a harmless bit of fun done somewhere that's really safe and taking a risk with your life. And I hate to use terms like nanny state or whatever. Like, I don't like to get into that whole thing. But it, it gets a little ridiculous. Like, you know, snowboarding is dangerous as hell. Mm -hmm. But they, you don't see the media just releasing constant warnings about the dangers of snowboarding. Like, we know that going through life can kill you. People will always find a way to injure themselves. If you are a manufacturer of, like, insulating foam that is intended to protect your head from banging into things, people are going to find a way to fucking eat it. Or stick it up their sinuses in some fashion or that is pressurized. other orifices. Yar. Stupid people are surprisingly brilliant when it comes to finding ways to hurt themselves with things that are intended not to hurt you. At least innovative. I'll, put a, I'll give them that. I don't know about That's smart, but definitely innovative. That's a good word. Yeah. Speaking of which, you mentioned the Tide Pod Challenge. Mm. The idea of quote-unquote forbidden snacks is not new. There's an entire subreddit dedicated to posting pictures of alluring, tempting, thoroughly inedible items that look like they would be delicious. Mm. Have you ever seen this? No. It's really fun. Okay. Here, for instance, is a forbidden Thanksgiving ham that is a petrified tree. Yeah, that doesn't look like any. It might sort of look like a confection, you know, like sort of a tiramisu or something. Here's a watermelon crystal. Okay, that one I can kind of understand. I might actually put that in my mouth thinking it was a candy. Forbidden gummy Buddhas. Oh, bro. Made of jade. Yeah, that's a good one to crack your teeth on. I really, looking at it right now, I just, mm, I want to lick it. I don't want to lick it because I don't like gummy bears that much, but it definitely does look like something that would be edible. This one's pretty good. These are crochet hooks, but it looks like one of those big uh, lollipops. Oh, yeah. It sort of looks like that or like Brighton Rock kind of. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Tasty. Hmm. But none of these forbidden snacks has captured the world's attention or proved to be as devilishly tempting as the detergent gushers known as Tide Pods. God. Tide Pods were first introduced by Procter & Gamble in 2012, and we have all seen them. They are brightly colored, single-use packets of laundry detergent, and I think, personally, they're super convenient. Oh, dude, I love them. We use them all the time. Yeah. So, side note, everyone, please stop eating these things because I do not want them to be banned. Yeah. Each dose, uh, so to speak of concentrated liquid laundry detergent is packaged in a dissolvable transparent casing constructed of a water-soluble substance called polyvinyl alcohol, or PVA. According to a Wired article, it's similar to like a clear version of Elmer's glue, basically. Yeah, I always thought it was sort of made out of some kind of glycerin, but yeah, that makes more sense. The website Know Your Meme once again claims that the earliest known online reference to the temptation of eating Tide Pods, quote, was on December 4th, 2013, in the Straight Dope forums, when member Syl Vorange submitted a post titled, People Are Eating Tide Pods, discussing rumors about people eating the detergent packs. Uh, yeah. The Tide Company was clearly aware of the danger, because shortly after the release of the product, the company added a kid-confounding, quote-unquote, latch to the top of the container. It didn't work, though, because like adults, many kids uh, also have hands and fingers. So in 2015, Tide added a bittering agent to the clear film covering. Mm -hmm. This is a substance called denatorium benzoate and is commonly acknowledged as one of the bitterest substances on earth. Rivaled only by my dark, jaded soul. <laughs> I guess the idea was to make Tide Pods uh, more unpalatable. Mm. Although by the time you're tasting the Tide Pod, I think the damage is kind of done. Yeah, if it's in your mouth, you done fucked up anyway. That is not a deterrent. It's basically just further punishment. Right. <laughs> this embittering substance is so strong that it is, quote, detectable at just a few parts per million, unquote. Yeah, damn. This makes me want to try them. 
I've never what wanted to try fucking... them before, but now we have them right over there. I'm not putting them in my fucking mouth. I just want to lick the outside just to find out like how oh, is that all that, you want to do <laughs> to find out how bitter that substance is. And by the way, Tide also claims to have toughened up the outer layer of the polyvinyl alcohol by making it much like thicker or stronger. They don't really specify, mm -hmm. but that just feels like even, even more of a challenge now. Yeah. You've just made it harder to complete the <laughs> challenge. You have not made it impossible. Now I want to lick the top and then I want to bite to see if I could get through it. What? I'm like, I don't... You can't stop me, Tide. <laughs> <laughs> I looked this up. The average human bite force is around 160 pounds per square inch. And even if you scale that down for a toddler, I'm pretty sure any kid could chomp right through that Elmer's glue exterior. You know what? I have a better, you know, Tide Pod challenge for everyone. Much safer. Who can throw one of those as hard as they possibly can? Like, how hard do you have to throw it to splatter it against a wall? Or against your friends. It could be like paintball, indoor paintball, paintball, the home version. <laughs> I like this. We have a bunch and I really have, I, you know, sometimes I want to huck things at you. That'd mm. be a great thing to huck at you. It's not going to do a lot of damage, but if I could get it to explode, it'd be pretty entertaining. You realize that if I do it back, you're going to be furious. <laughs> I'm very fast. Though. We've covered this. <laughs> it's true. You're <laughs> I feel very like quick. I, I can escape and I would just have to wait until you cool down. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to run from the house <laughs> and wait a few days. I would sleep in the car, and, and by the next day, I think you will have chilled out. Maybe. In 2015, a couple years after Tide began acknowledging and trying to address the problem of kids ingesting Tide Pods, Tide was, interestingly enough, also introducing an ad campaign called, seriously, the Tide Pod Challenge. Duh. It did not involve ingestion but did introduce the idea of challenges involving Tide, which would not be a good look in retrospect. Yeah. In 2017, the College Humor website released a video mocking the allure of Tide Pods and followed up with a few others as the idea went viral. The first video is titled, Don't Eat the Laundry Pods, and subtitled, Beautiful Poison. <laughs> in it, a young man warns his roommate not to eat the laundry pods that he has purchased and then exits the apartment leaving said roommate battling his urges and eventually succumbing to temptation. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I actually like where this is going. That's kind of funny. The video ends with the Tide Eater choking out the words, I don't regret it, on his way to the hospital. <laughs> Gross butt. <laughs> the concept of Tide Pod eating quickly went viral. And lest you think the danger is overblown, Snopes.com weighed in. Quote, we've received several inquiries from readers wanting to know whether people really were putting laundry detergent in their mouths on camera. They are. Unquote. Thanks, Snopes. The satirical news site The Onion may also have contributed to the challenge's virality with an article that supposedly was penned by a toddler titled, quote, So help me God, I'm going to eat one of those multicolored detergent pods, unquote. <laughs> so just how dangerous is a Tide Pod? The actual ingredients of a Tide Pod are many and varied, from stain-fighting enzymes and enzyme-releasing agents to whitening compounds. The more than 70 separate chemical ingredients are condensed so that they won't be rendered inert by water dilution. So these things are strong. Mm -hmm. And the dangerous-slash-toxic ingredients include ammonium, bleaches, and chemical fragrances. You do not want to bathe your insides with fragrant ammonium bleaches. Near. These are not harmless chemicals like salts and saccharins. These are, for instance, uh, methoxypolyoxymethylene melamine, a polymer that, quote, helps stabilize perfume, unquote. Yeah, you should definitely drink a gallon of that, that shit. Sounds delicious. Nom, 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 nom. So in conclusion, uh, don't eat the Tide Pods. <laughs> I don't usually really care that much about people playing stupid games and winning stupid prizes, yeah. but I do care about maintaining my access to products that make my life just a little bit easier. Word. So if I have to save some human lives in order to also save Tide Pods, <laughs> I will make that sacrifice. Yes, yes. We talked about ice-related challenges, and I mentioned that there were worse ones out there. Mm -hmm. Duncan, have you ever been so bored that you decided to give yourself frostbite? Fucking No. Not full-on hypothermia, to clarify. Just a, just a touch of very localized second or third degree nerve damage. Hmm. Intentionally causing blisters and skin lesions. You know, just the normal stuff people do in the internet era to pass the time. Well, yeah. I mean, it's six o'clock in the morning. You've just woken up and had your coffee. It's time to burn a <laughs> hole in your knee. As we mentioned earlier, there have been a couple of ice-related challenges that went fully viral online. One of them, as you mentioned before, was pretty harmless. The ice bucket challenge was basically a silly way of pretending that you were doing something charitable by doing something uncomfortable and attention whorish. Hmm. The purported goal of the challenge was to raise funds for an awareness of ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, 
And to illustrate just how pointless this challenge actually was, I had to look that up because I could not remember what disease the participants were raising awareness of. That's how raised my awareness was not. <laughs> Did they actually end up raising any money for these, this thing or... I think the idea was to actually get people to donate, but if you couldn't donate or for some reason didn't want to because you just wanted internet fame instead, you could then pour buckets of ice on yourself to spread the awareness because then you were like, quote unquote, doing something, which you quote unquote, weren't, Mm. although that second one doesn't need to be in quotes because you weren't. Yeah, it is. You weren't. But yeah. Okay. The ice bucket challenge was nakedly hypocritical and patently stupid, but ultimately kind of silly and arguably sort of fun. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, it's a hot day and you're bored. Mm -hmm. The salt and ice challenge, on the other hand, is just diabolical. Oh, boy. The way it works is that you either pour some salt on exposed skin, usually somewhere on your arm, or you dip an ice cube into salt, and then you press the cube against your skin and see how long you can hold it there. The salt lowers the melting point of the ice. There is a technical term for the result of this chemical reaction. It is a eutectic frigorific mixture. You fucking say that three times fast. (laughs) I personally love this podcast because I learned things that I never would have believed if someone had told me. I had no idea that there was a chemical reaction named Fraggle Rock Eugenics. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it sounds like a compliment you would give your girlfriend. You technically frigorific. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it is. Yeah. That's a superlative. Yes. Basically, the way this all works is that water molecules and salt, they mix together. And according to an article from Oxford Academic, quote, the salt neutralizes the ionic forces that allow ice to freeze at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees centigrade. This new lower melting point of the ice when applied to the skin can cause a cold injury, unquote. Hmm. That is actually a little bit of an understatement. Quote, the salt and ice challenge can quickly cause second and third degree injury similar to frostbite or being burnt with the metal in a lighter as well as causing painful open sores to form on the skin. Due to the numbing sensations of the cold and possible nerve damage during the stunt, participants are often unaware of the extent of any injuries sustained during the challenge, only feeling pain once the salt on their skin enters lesions created during the challenge, unquote. I mean, why, why wasn't there a lighter challenge, a Zippo challenge? Like, w- w- you're just burning yourself. With a lighter, you would actually, you'd feel it. Mm -hmm. Like with this, the ice has the numbing effect. Right. Anyway, these injuries can result in some pretty extreme scarring. As a 12-year-old boy learned in 2012, quote, the unidentified youth lay on his stomach during a sleepover at his house as his brother and a friend put salt in the form of a cross on his back and then put ice cubes atop the salt before applying pressure. Bruh. Was this an exorcism? Yeah. A summoning. Yeah. (laughs) Or some type of witchcraft. This is the Conjuring 4.0. Seriously. Yeah. Quote, his mother said her son withstood the challenge for 20 minutes, eventually losing any sense of pain or feeling. The Pittsburgh youth's injuries caused severe blistering and required drug treatment with a lotion that must be applied four times a day for months. He is not allowed to swim or go outside without a shirt and even must have his back washed if he sweats for the rest of the summer. Unquote. Dude, if, I, if that happened to me, I would be just constantly in shower because I sweat a lot. Oof, that just, this sounds so awful. Yeah. So we're going to kind of jump around between like the really dangerous ones and ones that might be a little more silly. Hmm? Many of these challenges walk the fine line between dangerous stupidity and mostly harmless fun, which also describes like 80% of the activities that I engaged in as a young boy. I mean, fuck, engage in now occasionally. Sometimes. But like when I was a kid, I skateboarded. Yeah. I was constantly attempting kickflips and trying to ollie onto rails. I was not good at it. <laughs> I never once landed a kickflip successfully, but I did bust my ass on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. I snowboarded and rode a motorcycle forever, so yeah. I sustained marginally serious injuries on the daily. Mm. So the idea that kids need to be protected from all forms of physical danger is a little hard for me to swallow, as we mentioned. And one internet challenge I definitely would have attempted as a kid, no question, is the milk crate challenge. What is this? This challenge involves stacking milk crates to create a stair-like structure that ascends to a platform and then descends on the other side. And the challenge is to walk the entire improvised staircase while the rickety, flimsy plastic crates shiver and shake and threaten to dump you on your ass. An ass that will inevitably land on the jagged plastic corner of one or two of the crates. Yeah, this sounds like an instant trip to the ER. I don't see why this is a quote-unquote challenge. It depends on how high you get these milk crates, but it also is just as most of the time you're just going to fall and look stupid. It's just the look stupid challenge, and I generally support those. (laughs) 
The Know Your Meme website has theorized that the challenge was inspired in June of 2011 with the debut of a video titled Guy Falls Off of Six Milk Crates. <laughs> I didn't watch it, so I'm not sure exactly what happens. I can't really report. Uh, I guess we'll never know. Uh, yeah. The challenge picked up steam in 2021 when TikTok users jumped on the bandwagon, but whether or not it resulted in a significant wave of hospitalizations is hard to gauge. My favorite complaint about this challenge from Wikipedia, quote, the challenge has also led to the concern of theft within the dairy industry and is considered a crime in many states. Dairy industries lose around $80 million per year due to theft, according to the IDFA in 2012, unquote. God. Let's not just focus on the kids, you guys. Right. Think about the corporations. That are federally <laughs> backed. This one, to me, is the most controversial of the viral trends that we're covering because, again, it is just not more dangerous than skateboarding or BMX bike riding or setting random things on fire or fucking around with BB guns or any of the million boneheaded activities that young boys engage in on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. If you're a parent, yeah, you know, try to get your kids not to do it. But if that's the worst thing your teenagers are doing, also count yourself lucky. Yeah, yeah. They could be trying to juggle syringes full of heroin. The next challenge is actually a series of challenges. Perhaps the most widespread and ubiquitous of potentially dangerous viral challenges involves the consumption of extremely hot peppers. Oh boy. The challenge evolves with each new hottest pepper on earth claim. So there have been the scorpion pepper challenges and the ghost pepper challenges and my personal favorite, the Carolina Reaper challenges. Because mm -hmm. that was kind of the high point of this, I think. Mm. I was super addicted to these. I love the show Hot Ones. I like seeing celebrities and other like very composed and attractive people just sweat and shake and lose their composure. And snot all over themselves. It's awesome. I have seen so many people eating hot peppers online, celebrities and peasants alike. I clearly enjoy that particular type of short-term suffering on some base level. Yeah. Probably my favorite video of a hot pepper challenge because it is the greatest example of an experience that we have discussed many times on this show, the act of finding out after having fucked around. Ah, yes. And I think I've discussed it on an After Midnight episode before. This is the video titled Carolina Reaper Challenge Gone Wrong, in which two young ladies who are clearly attempting to be thirst traps for views and likes mm. get themselves into a very unfortunate predicament. The first time I watched this, it was honestly a little bit terrifying. So be warned, mm -hmm. but I promise everything works out okay. The girls are fine. With that said, <laughs> holy fuck. <laughs> okay. It goes from kind of annoying to like pretty funny to not funny at all real quick. Really? Are they like scantily clad? Because you said it's thirst traps. So I'm mm -hmm. just wondering if they're like clad in bikinis and then start throwing up fiery mace on each other or something. You pretty much summed it up. Damn. I'm, I must have paid my prescience bill. There are other people involved. So you will hear the parents and then there's the cameraman who seems to think it's all pretty funny until it's not. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today I have Sabrina here with me and today we're going to be eating the Carolina Reaper pepper. These are the world's hottest pepper. Are you ready for this? I don't know. Are you? Not at all. <laughs> I'm literally shaking right now. I'm scared for my stomach. I literally smell deadly. Oh, it actually smells good. Oh my god. Oh my god. I can't feel my nose. Uh, uh, okay, okay. All right. Okay. Okay, okay. Lay back. Lay back. Holy shit. Lay back. Are you okay? No. That wasn't a good idea. Holy hell. All right. This was the worst idea ever. The burn will not go away. <laughs> Serena needs her inhaler. She can't breathe. It hurts. Come on, come inside. I'm going to put it on the ass. Get that dog inside. Damn. I didn't think it hurt that bad. This is not good. This is not fucking good. Lizzie's throwing up now. Uh. Okay, so that didn't turn out how I planned. I thought I was gonna take it like a champ. So did I. This is like hours later. I'm sure. I what even happened to her, honestly? I thought I was gonna die, pass out. Pass out. Pass out. I'm on fire right now, and it's, it's, not, it's not even that hot outside. I'm on fire, though. Like, I'm all red and stuff. You were throwing up blood. 
I know, I was throwing up blood. You guys can see it in Lance's vlog too. <laughs> I'll leave a link in the top of the description. No, if you don't, guys did enjoy why? this video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. <laughs> and thank you, Sabrina, for being here with You're me. Welcome. And I'm sorry for doing that to you. <laughs> and, <Okay. laughs> and we will see you guys next time. Oh, my stomach. Like and subscribe for more blood vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who's made themselves vomit blood, that wasn't from the pepper. You can throw up so hard that you basically give yourself a throat bleed like a nosebleed. Like, it's just, yeah, it's not it was, great, but it's not deadly. The one girl has a full-on panic attack. She also has, uh, clearly, asthma and is, you know, it's bad. Like, this became a fucking horror movie. Right. So we only have two more challenges to go, Duncan. Okay. This next one, oh, wow. I feel I've made it pretty clear by now that I was a stupid teenager. Yes. And I understand that teenage brains are not fully formed, yada, yada. But this next one is just confounding. Okay. <laughs> Would you take part, if given the opportunity, Duncan, in the Skull Breaker Challenge? Fucking no. <laughs> this one is basically just bullying. It's okay. like assault. So the way this works is that three people stand side by side. The two on the outside are in on the prank. The one in the middle does not know what's happening. That's the mark. Mm. The two on the outside jump simultaneously, and then they encourage the person in the middle to do the same. They kind of try to get it through peer pressure, like get this person to jump. And then when that person jumps, they kick his legs out from under him. Oh, I think this is, I, I might have misquoted early when I was saying the clothesline challenge. I think this is that. Mm, okay. C because this is where pe a lot of people ended up on their like, you know, cervical, you know, neck bones or like on their skulls. Yeah. Thus the name. Yeah. <laughs> It should be called the shitty friend challenge. Yeah. Frenemy challenge. It's actually a good thing as long as you don't genuinely break your skull because you are finding out who your friends are or aren't. Right. From BBC.com, quote, in February 2020, a UK mother whose daughter had taken part in the challenge with two friends wrote on Facebook, quote, please, please, if you have teenagers doing TikToks, do not let them get involved in this. I'm sitting in the accident and emergency room with my daughter with a severe spinal injury, unquote. Yep. And wow. I mean, ultimately, this isn't so much a prank as it is just violence. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a funny stunt that you pull on your friends. This is how you assassinate a rival. Yeah. <laughs> this is right up there with the ball peen hammer challenge. <laughs> friends don't break friends' skulls. Yeah. From the Center for Injury Research and Prevention, quote, this challenge is alarming for several reasons. <laughs> You fucking think? <laughs> falls from greater than five feet, which would be the majority of these falls, are at higher risk to cause skull fractures and intracranial bleeds. This was the Center of Injury Research and Prevention, a division of No Shit Sherlock, funded by Captain Obvious. <laughs> I'm actually a <laughs> contributor to that, uh, that fund, so yeah, I, I really... Keep their name out your mouth. Other notable injuries. A 13-year-old girl in Massachusetts was hospitalized with a concussion. An Arkansas teenager lost consciousness, was treated for a concussion. An Arizona boy, say it with me, lost consciousness. consciousness treated for a concussion. <laughs> uh, received facial sutures. Plot twist. Yeah, he, he went forward <laughs> instead of backward. Mm -hmm. Got it. 13-year-old boy from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, lost consciousness and was hospitalized with a Con concussion. concussion. <laughs> right. Quote, in New Jersey, the Camden County Prosecutor's Office said two children had been charged with third-degree aggravated assault and third-degree endangering an injured victim after an incident involving the prank, unquote. And as dumb as this is, I guess I'm still going to have to offer a little bit of a caveat did you ever do the thing, Duncan, where you kicked a chair out from under your buddy, like right as he was trying to sit down? Well, yes, and um, I never did it backwards so that his head or neck or something like that would hit the seat. Really? I always did it to the side, so they mm. were very unlikely to like hit anything. I was reckless and malicious and <laughs> did it uh, with wanton abandonment, just mm. constantly kicking chairs out from under my friends. Thought it was hilarious. Could have absolutely killed people. It, now, see, it is funny when it's those plastic chairs where you can just kick the legs clean off them right. because they're not in danger of breaking <laughs> their neck on a plastic shitty lawn chair. Well, the other difference is like this prank takes place from a standing position. This skull yes. breaker prank, your head is going to fall the entire distance of your height. Right. This is where it comes in handy, by the way, being very short. <laughs> as much as I would like to be six foot two, I do not want that much distance between my skull and the breaker portion of the challenge. Because physics. <laughs> exactly. Hey, Insomniacs, just a reminder that for as little as $3 a month, you can join Patreon and get bonus episodes, access to live video streams of After Midnight shows, plus a ton of other perks, and of course, everything we release for patrons is 100% ad-free. Just head over to patreon.com slash mffi 
to support our podcast. Now back to the show. Final challenge. Oh, yes. Quote, the FDA has a warning for the TikTok generation. Don't use bright blue over-the-counter medications as marinade, even if social media challenges tell you to do so. Unquote. You, you fucking what when? <laughs> I'm going to introduce this next challenge by describing one of these viral TikTok videos from 2022. The video begins with a guy dousing two chicken breasts with a bottle of nighttime medication saying, quote, I got sick last night, so I'm cooking up some NyQuil chicken. What the fuck? He then provides helpful directions while he cooks. Like, you want to let it sit there and let it sizzle for about five to 30 minutes. <laughs> for 10 to 25,000 hours. The wildly imprecise estimations will forever be a cornerstone of our humor. Oh, yes. It's a well played. Hmm. Game recognized game. <laughs> the man continues season that NyQuil in there just at the right temperature. What you're looking for is that blue color. <laughs> Sometimes the steam really makes you sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called a contact high, you inebriate. One of my favorite lines, quote, I've done this in the past, and usually I use about four thirds of the bottle. Whoa. <laughs> you could tell it was, well, yeah. the effect was already, already uh, hitting him. <laughs> yeah, because fractions were a problem. I think you get the idea. This is not a serious challenge. Hmm. This is trolling. And anyone emulating these videos would be doing it for the lulls. Hmm. But doing things for laughs can get you killed, as we all learned from the weasels in Roger Rabbit. <laughs> if you laugh too hard, your soul might just exit your body like U-shaped steam. That's just science. Yeah, yeah. But apparently the dangers posed by the so-called sleepy chicken challenge became serious enough for the FDA to release a warning in September of 2022. From that warning, quote, the challenge sounds silly and unappetizing, and it is, but it could also be very unsafe. Boiling a medication can make it much more concentrated and change its properties in other ways. Even if you don't eat the chicken, inhaling the medication's vapors while cooking could cause high levels of the drugs to enter your body. It could also hurt your lungs. Put simply, someone could take a dangerously high amount of the cough and cold medication without even realizing it. Yes, and anyone who's ever even vaguely heard of freebasing would know that. <laughs> freebasing NyQuil oh, just sounds terrible. Yes, yeah, not a win-win. A Forbes article expanded on the dangers, quote, different cold and cough medications may have different ingredients, but common active ingredients include dextromethorphan, mm -hmm. acetaminophen, and antihistamines like doxylamine succinate. Too much dextromethorphan, an opioid that is commonly in cough suppressants, can result in drowsiness, dizziness, seizures, nausea, vomiting, changes in blood pressure, constipation, breathing problems, blurry vision, twitching, palpitations, high fevers, hallucinations, brain damage, and coma. What about deliciousness? <laughs> it's that's, not. That's the real question, though. Is, <laughs> I, see, the whole problem with this is that, like, I am being tempted now. Yeah. Things I was never tempted before. Now I want to know, what does NyQuil chicken taste like? You are so impressionable. It's <laughs> honestly terrifying. Too much acetaminophen could damage your liver and lead to liver failure. Yep. Also, it fucks your kidneys. Too much doxylamine succinate can <laughs> result in... A pleasured nate. <laughs> <laughs> Dry mouth, dilated pupils, rhabdomyolysis. I don't know. There's a lot of bad things. Don't bad, do bad it. Thing. Don't do it. Why the fuck it's, would you do it? I'm done with it. It ends with death. Yes. So that's, that's really what it comes down to. We're boiling down to death here in various <laughs> paths and routes. The quote ends, finally, heating a medication can change its properties in various ways. It can be like a box of potentially really bad chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Unquote. Fucking really? You went forced gump at the end? Bro. I think you know exactly what you're going to get. Yeah. Which is very sick, one way or another. Yeah. So don't do this. Don't do any of these, except maybe the saltines and the milk crate thing. I support both of those <laughs> heartily. I think they just sound like good, healthy fun. And this will be the end of the podcast. Yeah, I was going to say, until one of <laughs> somebody we know aspirates a bunch of chewed up fucking saltine and dies. While they're climbing up. Climbing milk crates and breaks their neck. Yeah. So we, they have to like struggle to find out which one killed them. Don't do either of those if you're under 18. I will say that. Oh, I see. There's an age of consent situation with death. <laughs> well, if you were an adult and you want to bust your ass on a bunch of milk crates and inhale wheat cracker. Yeah. I, who am I to stop you? It, you know what? It's safer than kickflips. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Safer than kickflips. I'm putting that on every box of saltines <laughs> with a Sharpie that I can find. That's like 99% of the things you can do in the world, honestly. Fair. That's fair. Oh, hey, Duncan. Oh, uh, yes? We have a video live stream mailbag episode coming up, and mm -hmm. it is available to everyone. You do not have to be a patron. If you want to see what we look like for some reason, if you're <laughs> a masochist, 
If you want to yell questions at us via chat, we will be posting the link on our free Discord community. It will be on Tuesday, June 4th at 7 p.m. Pacific time. We can also maybe do it on the instagram itch maybe? Uh, you can't put a link directly to like a YouTube on Instagram. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know. We have some new menaces. Men- menace I. I never, you know, we can't pluralize it. I don't and know. minions. And I will get to them in just a second, but I did want to quickly cover some reviews from Spotify. Mm-hmm. In case you did not know, if you are a Spotify listener, you can leave comments on individual episodes. Hmm. One of which says, love this show. Always fascinating and funny. The Kermit and Fozzie of the podcast universe. They never fail to educate and entertain. I call Fozzie. <laughs> I want to know who's Kermit. I think it's you. Because I'm be, more of the bear. I want to be Kermit. It's not easy being chained. <laughs> Another comment. Well, this episode was a bit disturbing. Still a great episode. Somehow y'all managed to make it entertaining. Good on you. I believe that was the... Sounds like PETA. PETA episode. Yeah. Absolutely. Another comment. Don't worry. I'll save the other dude's soul. Or at least try to pray. <laughs> I like that he backed off. Yeah, or, on, I'll try to pray for him. I, yeah, think, yeah. I think he listened to a few more and went back and edited that comment. Yeah, he was like, meh, might be a lost cause. Final comment. Hi, it's as amazing as always. I recently made a huge project on the Bay of Pigs and used your episode as a main source. Yo. My teacher is a bit hesitant that my main source is a podcast, but he's just dumb. <laughs> wow. <laughs> There's so much awesome in that comment. I, I cannot. support every aspect of this comment. Yes. <laughs> you get a miffy stamp of approval. God damn. And also, uh, it's all wrong. Everything in this comment is wrong. But <laughs> I, well, like I said, I still support it. It's like kick flips. This is, there's nothing okay about this, but, uh, you still know, awesome. it's still amazing. Yeah. And we have new menaces. Meet Martin Oakley. Oh. Of sunglass fame. Yes. Meet John W. I feel like. These, both th- of these we've had. I feel like we have. Yeah. We're getting bamboozled yet again. <laughs> Meet Amy, just Amy. Is is this Amy no, no, no P again? Nope, not current Amy. This is a different Amy. New Amy. I'm not going to give her email address out. That's how I know it's not, though. Okay. Uh, but she just gave us Amy, so I don't think she wants much more information out there in the world. Probably shouldn't dox her on she our comments. does not want to be associated with this podcast. Neither do I, really. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Too late. And just constant living a shame spiral. <laughs> We also have Christy. Christy is a new minion. And again, no last name because people are wising up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give them little to no ammo and you're safe. Smart. Well played, Amy and Christy. And that brings us to the end. Ladies, gents, germs, and theys. Please go to the Instagram image, give Shane and Inky some love, go to the Patreon and give us moolala, uh, go and buy some merch. You know you need Miffy merch in your life, you just need to admit it to yourself and others. And then otherwise, and forever after, knowledge is power, sleep is overrated.